Welcome back. Special greetings uh, from Germany, a group of believers in Germany, in Ujambo to Kenya, Ujambo Buana, Ujambo Mama, Ujambo Dada. I'm uh, Ingo Sorki, Pastor Ingo, or, or just Ingo is okay too. And greetings to Norway as well. And whoever is watching now or later on, we are doing a series on marriage and relationships called 4-2 to be one, keeping your vows while keeping your vows, Bible-based, Christ-centered relationships. We've talked about uh, Genesis chapter one. Everything happens through separation, except Adam and Eve at the end get put together as one flesh. And we want to avoid, especially as men, causing a separation in our marriages that is anti-God. God was the one who put Adam and Eve together. And then yesterday we looked at various things. Ten Commandments are very family-oriented. But we especially looked at 2 Samuel chapter 11, David and Bathsheba. And the problem there was David ran many, many stop signs before the adultery. And he could have stopped several times before the crash. And today we uh, will answer one question. We will look at one question that came yesterday. And... Uh, then we will look at Ephesians and the book of Revelation, and then we'll change to a practical aspect of relationships. So a lot planned today. Uh, let us pray together. And then I share a Bible verse with you that I forgot to put on my first page. And we will look at uh, David and Bathsheba for a couple minutes only, and then move into a big topic, how Paul describes marriage. Big plans today. I'm excited. Thank you for joining. Uh, Asante. Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, I want to pray a prayer from John the Baptist. I must decrease and you must increase. We pray for your Holy Spirit for our relationships. Not worldly wisdom, but divine, divine wisdom from your word. Let there be less of me and more of you. And today we also pray again for healing of broken relationships. So much damage, hurt feelings, insults, we ask for forgiveness. I pray our marriages, our relationships, those who are single, those who are planning to get married, that all our relationships, might be pure, appropriate, <clears throat> healthy, and holy, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I will briefly show you the screen and then move it away so you can see me better. We'll see how that works out. I don't know what you see. <laughs> Here's a verse I wanted to share with you from Vakurinto. We want to, with, with commandment number 10, thou shalt not covet in King James. That happens in our frontal lobe, only in our brain. No hands. We're just thinking sinful thoughts. And we want to 
not covered anymore. We want to subject our thinking to God. And this is a perfect verse for that. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Our, not just our actions, but our mere thoughts subjected to God. Uh, yesterday, a question came up. Here it is. It came from Kenya, I think. The person starts with P. A uh, very good question. Was David's marriage to Bathsheba approved by God? I took a close look at this uh, yesterday evening for an hour or two. I looked at about a dozen commentaries, including two Jewish ones. I looked at the text, and I have it here for you in Kiswahili. Uh, in English, it's Second Samuel 11.27. When her Bathsheba's mourning was over, over the death of her child, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David, oh, the, the mourning was over her husband. That's right. Um, not her child yet. That was over her murdered husband. She bore him a son, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And when Lord is capitalized, it means the four letters, tetragrammaton, Yahweh or Jehovah are written there. I found it interesting, half of the commentaries and study Bibles, I looked at Andrew study Bibles, John MacArthur study Bible, Geneva study Bible, uh, two Jewish commentaries, half of them do not comment on David marrying Bathsheba. No, no comment at all. And the others, they mention that David married Bathsheba, but they don't analyze, was that God's will? Did he have to do that based on Leviticus? N nothing. So not a single commentary. I looked in the Adventist Bible commentary as well, the New Andrews uh, Bible commentary. Nobody comments or evaluates the marriage of David to Bathsheba. When we read the text itself, uh, the Hebrew word davar is, is the word thing, but the thing, the word, the matter that David did, and that might include the marriage. I don't know Leviticus well enough. I've studied Leviticus. But I don't know it well enough to judge, did David have to marry Bathsheba? Uh, I don't know. I would have to ask an Old Testament expert, rabbi, somebody. But I find it interesting that the marriage itself is not the problem or question, I think, whether it was right or wrong. What was wrong was David trying to cover up his sin, including with the marriage. I think David was thinking, if. If I just, this is very important for us practically, uh, especially as men. If I just marry her, then everything is fine. And then everything is okay. The sin gets covered up. Um, then we are a family and then everything is okay. Very dangerous thinking. And I find it fascinating that God knows what we're doing and thinking and how we act. and But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. For, for some reason, for 6,000 years, we think we can hide, cover up, um, add a lie to cover up a lie and get away with it. No consequences. And, and we fix it ourselves. I think what is happening here in verse 27 is righteousness by works. David is trying to fix his sin. He, he's doing this and that and, and Uriah the Hittite, her husband, and, and he avoids God. And he's not honest with himself. And it's a cover up. We do it still today in the year 2023 in our relationships. And uh, gentlemen, especially, I want to appeal to you. 
have a moment with God and be brutally honest, totally honest. Are you lying? Are you cheating? Are you hiding things? Do you have to clear your internet history so your wife doesn't see that? Do you clear out the YouTube videos so the list disappears? Nobody can see what you've been watching. Uh, the only, I, I've told students, the only person we are fooling when we're cheating is ourselves. We think we get away with it, but God knows. And we know too. And by the way, that is the word conscience. Conscience. Con is Latin means with. Conscience. Conscience. Science, knowledge, when, when our conscience bothers us, and unfortunately our conscience is seared now, we don't even feel guilt anymore. But when our conscience speaks to us, that means we know that God knows. And God knows that we know. We know that God knows that we know that God knows that we know. And we, we need to get out of this way. Life is not a game. A marriage is not a game. The person that we are with is, is not a joke. It's, it's a real human being, God's daughter. So gentlemen, um, you don't want a prophet telling you, coming to you, Nathan, saying, this is displeasing to God. Your life is not pleasing to God. Uh, there's an irony in this verse, and then we'll move on. Um, David sent for Bathsheba. See, he's done that before. It led to adultery. In fact, the word sent, I counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. At least ten times in 2 Samuel 11, verse 27. There's a reason why I'm talking about this question for ten minutes. There's a 10 times David sends, he sends for Bathsheba, he sends a messenger, he sends to Uriah the Hittite, he was not an Israelite, and then finally he sends for Bathsheba, and eventually, after 10 times David sending, God has enough, and God sends Nathan to confront David. So I pray today, this moment, tonight in the evening in, in Kenya and Norway, wherever you are, that God could say, I am pleased with you. A very parallel, interesting story with Abigail in 1 Samuel 25. He, he took her. She became his wife. Um, now, it's a mess. David creates a mess. Could have been avoided. He didn't have to do this. But what a mess. Adultery, murder, dead child, lying. Out of all this comes a marriage, whether it's right or wrong. And, and God can still use a negative situation for his honor and glory. That's amazing. Solomon is born later on, wisest man on earth. Then he has problems with women. And uh, Solomon is an ancestor of the Messiah. So what did I just do for 10 minutes? Took 10 minutes. Samahani. I might have to blow my nose. I have allergies in Texas. Um, we studied the Bible. The commentaries didn't say anything, so we just took one verse. We read it a couple of times. We thought about it. We looked at the words. Very clear message. Lord was displeased with David. We, we thought about it. We analyzed it. Concordance. Ten minutes. Well, I spent more than ten minutes yesterday pondering this question. If you do this with your wife as a family, as a couple and as a family, a miracle will take place. You're not solving your finances. You're not analyzing your communication, psychology. You are wrestling, studying the word of God. And in that process, the, the word of God creates life. In that process, 
you will have a better relationship. Eva, I'm sorry I can't move. Let me see if I can. There we go. What do I look like now? You are the same, small man. Small man. <laughs> well, that might be good. I, I must decrease, he must increase. Um, yeah, I, let me try one thing. We can edit this out or just leave it. Um, I'm probably not any bigger now. Is I like to look at you face to face sometimes when I speak, but I'm still small. Yeah, that's okay. Don't you uh, just well, have to, uh, to take the PowerPoint away? Yeah, I just took it away. There's um, now I now I stopped screen sharing. Am I still small? Now you're a big man. Ah, so it's when I screen share, I become small. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, I, I demonstrated a Bible study. Um, I don't know all the answers. I would be interested to see the Jewish legal Old Testament ramifications of David and Bathsheba and that marriage. That, that would be interesting for me. Um, but I'm, I'm studying a text, asking questions. Um you don't have to have study Bibles and commentaries and all that, but I was interested to see, does anybody in the theology world, scholarly world, deal with that question of that marriage? Nobody does. I need to look at some other commentaries. Um, but that was, that was an interesting question. I have more questions. I will answer one tomorrow or Friday or several as they come. One was, what do you think about counseling? Um, I will answer that one tomorrow. I have thoughts on that, very direct thoughts on it from personal experience, observation. And uh, I don't consider myself a marriage counselor. And so that's why I developed a, a system here for two to be one that draws couples into the word of God and closer to God. I, I hope it makes sense. And I, I pray it works. It should work if you allow the process with the word of God to take place in your life. And uh, I also got a question. What is your best marriage advice? I will give you a hint. I might address that on Friday. Eternity. We live where we get married when we're 20 to 30. Plus minus. We live an average of 70 to 80 years. I worked in a hospice. The average age of death for women was 83.4, and the average death for men was 81.1 or so. I kept the statistics. Um, if you think about that, so by the time you get married and realize you're alive and you're living, you're 20. And then you have about 50 years together. What is 50 years compared to eternity? Live your life on earth with all its problems and suffering, but you are living for eternity. Just keep that in mind. I want to show you a text. I will turn on screen sharing for a little while again. We want to study a text that is... Amazing. And I think profoundly helpful for couples. Share screen. There we go. My poor video editor people. I don't know anything about video editing. I know it takes hours. I'm not sure if you can see that. I'm putting it in the middle. And this to the front. There we go. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23 is our main text today. Uh, I should just read it so it's recorded and then we'll talk about it. I have a Swahili Bible here. Two Greek Bibles and an English Bible. What should we do? Well, should go with English. 
No German Bible. There's something in this chapter, I think, that can revolutionize our relationships. Wives. Now, we, we start at verse 22. That might be unfortunate that the Bibles were divided at verse 22. I'm curious to see where my brand new Swahili Bible divides the chapter. Usually there's a break between 21 and 22 in Ephesians chapter 5. The theme of submitting to one another starts in verse 21. We normally only quote verse 22, which says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Amen. Wives need to submit to their husbands. Well, wait, wait a minute. There's also verse 23. For the husband is head of the wife. Amen. We are the men and we, what we say, we, family does. Oh, wait, wait, there's more. As also Christ is head of the church, he is the savior of the body. We, we will talk about all of this. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. I've had couples in my office and the man quoted this and said, Pastor, it is in the Bible. The so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything, subject to their husband. But then comes verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Do you realize how sad this is? That Paul, you stood at the wedding altar and said, I do. You loved your wife. You wanted to be with her. And now Paul has to tell husbands to love their wives. We have to be told in the Bible to love our wives how far we have fallen. Unbelievable. Husband, loves you, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself to, for her. We need to talk about that that he might sanctify, cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh. We are so corrupted and perverse in our culture that we mutilate our own bodies now. We, we hate ourselves. That's not how it's supposed to be. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And now he quotes from Genesis. That is why Genesis is so important. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. We are told three times, men, I'm talking to you men, three times we are told to love our wives in 11 verses. Uh, I want to point out a few things here. I'll, I'll leave up the screen for now. I would say the reason our marriages are under assault and attacked so much and it's so difficult to be married and the divorce rate is 50% in the world. And, and a lot of people don't even get married anymore. The institution of marriage is waning in the Western world. And then other groups want the right to be married, even though marriage is a, a male and a female, period, end of discussion. Uh, what, what a mess. But let's take a look at this uh, for a second. I would suggest the problem with our relationships is because the enemy doesn't like a harmonious, good marriage. Why not? Because marriage is the mirror of God's love to the world. 
that is so important. I want to say that again and uh, look at you while I'm speaking. Marriage is the mirror of God's love to the world. And that is why Satan wants to destroy our relationships. He, he's not just interested in destroying a family. He loves doing that. But what I'm reading in the Apostle Paul is that behind the marriage, a, a love between a male and a female, who brought them together? God. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. So if he can break this up, it's an atheistic action. It's not just breaking up the family. It is removing God from the ceremony. So it's a, it's a theological matter, a destroyed family. Because a, a loving relationship between husband and wife is a 24-7 sermon to the world. God wants to demonstrate the love of his son, his, his love for the world through the love of his son sent to the world. And then in his relation of Christ to the church. So that means when, when I'm driving a wedge between myself and my wife, cause separation that God put together, I'm destroying not just my wife, my family, I'm destroying an opportunity for God to demonstrate his love to the world. This is huge. You, you realize how, how big marriage is. It's not just a man and a woman falling in love. They have a ceremony and a wedding and have a family. God wants to preach through our relationship. There are a few other things that are very interesting. Women submit to the man because he's the man. No. The submission is by the female to the man, but not period, comma. This is important, gentlemen, please. The submission of the wife is not to a man, period. The submission of the wife is to a man, comma, who acts like Christ in his relationship. I want to shout. It is not just a female submitting to a man. Any culture can do that, right? And, and lots of cultures have that concept. But Paul goes a, a huge step further. He's asking the wife to submit as to the Lord in verse 22. And then in verse, uh, I believe, 25, it is just as Christ gave himself for her. Men, Paul is asking the wife to submit to a man who is willing to die like Christ for his family. It's not just a gender submission. Female needs to submit to man. A woman was deceived first. It, it is a Christ-like husband that the woman is asked to submit to you. So my question to you then is, obviously, are you a Christ-like husband? Are, are you like Jesus? the tone of your voice. And, and I'm not talking about a soft, squishy religion with just emotions and only grace. Most of Christianity in the Western world is, is love and grace and it's cheap love and cheap grace. Without much Bible, without truth, it's just this warm, fuzzy psychology church. It's not what I'm talking about. There, there's a, a manhood, a toughness, a sternness to men. I loved reading a book called Man of Steel and Velvet. It's out of print now. Um, the, the man becomes more and more like Jesus. And according to Paul, that means death. That's right. To the point of death. 
And to that kind of man, the woman submits. Now, I, I shared this with a group of nurses, non-Adventist, uh, I don't know what background they were, nurses at the university. The, the nursing students had to take uh, religion classes, including what we call an upper division religion class. And they took New Testament from me. And I'm describing Ephesians chapter five to them. And I'm describing the man, what kind of man the woman submits to. And we're talking about Western society and, and women's liberation, all that. And I'm describing the man the way Paul describes him in, in, in Ephesians 5 and from Genesis 1 for 2 TB1 in the classroom. And it comes to the end of the class. I have to stop. And, and a girl in the back raises her hand. And she asks, where can I find such a man? Where can I find such a man? That, that is, ouch. Yeah. There are not enough men like that around. Um, where have all the men gone? Uh, God asked in the Garden of Eden, Adam, where are you? So I'm asking you, man, where are you? Where have you gone? What happened? Why, why do you not act like Jesus? Why do we men sometimes act like, I'm going to say it into the camera, microphone. Why do we act like jerks? Impatient. The, the women in our lives, they push the wrong button and we explode with an anger problem. Why are we not under the management of Jesus Christ? Why does... Sin, we allow sin and lust and sinful nature to flare up and damage. The, the one thing that God put together in the Garden of Eden at the end, unseparation. The, these are hard questions. Um, what else do we find in uh, Ephesians? The purpose. Wow. Do you, you want to know the will of God in your life? Yeah. I would like to know, should I move here, there, do this, do that? The will of God to a degree is specified. And in our married relations, it's verse 26, sanctification, cleansing, washing of water by the word. What does that mean? That means we men, the women are responsible to read the Bible for themselves. Okay. But we men have a responsibility to introduce the word of God into our family, like a, a daily sacrifice. So I pray you take time every day. It doesn't have to be long. I've heard of families where the man preaches for two hours. N no. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, little children, five minutes. But, but the point is you introduce the word of God appropriately in the language of the family, children, wife, to the most important human being in your life, your wife. And Paul describes it as a setting apart, a sanctification, a cleansing, a, a washing with the word. And then he says, so the wife can be presented back to God without blemish. That is sacrifice language. Your wife is described in the language of the sacrificial animal, which is a symbol of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm not talking women's ordination or anything like that. Don't misunderstand. I, I'm, I'm reading the language that Paul uses in Ephesians 5, and he uses the wording that is used for the Passover lamb without blemish. And, and we men have the responsibility to present our wives back to Jesus at the second coming. What have you done with my daughter? We don't own the wife. Jesus does. We're practicing in our marriage stewardship, how we take care of our families. A serious business. Why? 
There it is, verse 27. Present her to himself, a glorious church, not spot, wrinkled, but holy, without blemish. So here it is. In order to present our wives without blemish, like Jesus, we have to become like Jesus. And that is my key, my personal key to marriage counseling is not psychology, but it's mainly to get the man to Jesus Christ so he becomes more like Jesus. Now, what you will notice, I notice in my own life, the harder I try, the closer I get to Jesus, the more scum rises to the surface. And the more sinful I appear, and that drives me even closer to Christ. And I have to be broken and die to self. That is marriage. It's not just love between a male and a female and a ceremony and, and a legal contract. The, it, it's, it's about Jesus. No hate nourishes, cherishes just as the Lord does the church. And then comes this creation appeal. Question, where can you find such a man? So gentlemen, married, unmarried, become a man like that. And if you have a hard time finding a spouse, let me tell you a secret. It's not about you finding the right person. It's you becoming the right person. And when God recognizes your heart and overcoming and character development, then he will send you the right person because you have become the right person for that right person. Does that make sense? Uh, I will go back to screen sharing. I want to read a quote to you. Here we go. And then I will go to Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. Mount of Blessing, page 063. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, Ellen White, page 63. She was married. She had four children. She lost two children to death. One was 16 years old and the other, I think, three months old. So she knew about grief and suffering. And she lost her husband early on. Now... Listen to what she writes, not just as a prophet. I believe in the inspiration of Ellen White. L listen to what she says as a wife, mother, prophet, Bible student, and pioneer. He referred them, Jesus did, to the blessed days of Eden when God pronounced all things very good. Not until marriage do we have very good? And man alone was not good. In a perfect world, a single man alone, not good. Having said that, it is okay to be single. Not every person on this earth has to get married. Then marriage and the Sabbath had their origin twin institutions for the glory of God in the benefit of humanity. I don't know if you can see my highlight. Let me highlight this. Ellen White points out that the sacredness of marriage is on the same level as that of the Sabbath. Can you wrap your mind around that? If you are the cause of separation in your relationship, it is the equivalent of you starting to keep Sunday holy instead of Sabbath. Isn't that something? Sabbath and marriage, same level of sacredness then as the creator joined the hands of the holy pair in wedlock saying a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave you leave to cleave i literally did that Seven thousand kilometers by the way from oslo to uh, nairobi is over ten thousand kilometers i left home to cleave to my wife my poor parents they haven't seen me much the last 30 years. Shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one. Uh, he enunciated the law of marriage for all the children of Adam to the close of time. This is a very significant statement because in the year 2023, 
this concept is being questioned and challenged. I have a colleague who used to show a, a video in an ethics class. It was a man getting married to a man. My colleague said 15, 20 years ago, those were VHS tapes, when the camera swung over with organ music and a nice church, man in a tux, white shirt, and the camera swung over to the bride, it showed another man in a tux, man marrying a man. My colleague says 20, 15 years ago, the students would go, <gasps> there was a reaction of shock. <gasps> Now, there's no more <gasps> shock reaction. It's just accepted. But it's interesting that she says this like that. The law of marriage, male and a female, to the close of time. That which the eternal father himself had pronounced good was the law of highest blessing and development for man. Like every other one of God's good gifts entrusted to the keeping of humanity, marriage has been perverted by sin. But it is the purpose of the gospel. That is why I developed for two to be one. It is not the purpose of psychology, of secular wisdom, of, of good advice. The gospel, Jesus Christ, to restore its purity and beauty. Am I intense today? Yeah, it's intense. This, this is big stuff. In both the Old and New Testament, the marriage relation is employed to represent the tender and sacred tender, tenderness. If you're rough with your wife, even if she's wrong, you're at fault. Tender and sacred union that exists between Christ and his people, the redeemed ones, whom he has purchased at the cost of Calvary. The grace of Christ and this alone can make this institution, I got to repeat that, uh, the grace of Christ and this alone can make this institution what God designed it should be, an agent for the blessing and uplifting of humanity. And thus the families of earth in their unity and peace and love may represent the family of heaven. Wow, what a privilege, what a responsibility. Now as in Christ's day, the condition of society represents, presents a sad comment upon heaven's ideal of this sacred relation. Yet even for those who have found bitterness and disappointment where they had hoped for companionship and joy, the gospel of Christ offers a solace. I have a little friend. She's not little anymore. Her name is Solace. If you're watching this, Solace, I should dedicate it to you. The patience and gentleness which his spirit can impart will sweeten the bitter lot. The heart in which Christ dwells will be so filled, so satisfied with his love that it will not be consumed with longing to attract sympathy and attention to itself. Through the surrender of the soul to God, his wisdom can accomplish what human wisdom fails to do. And now here it comes. I, I've highlighted this in pink. Through the revelation or peach colored, through the revelation of his grace, hearts that were once indifferent or estranged may be united in bonds that are firmer and more enduring than those of earth, the golden bonds of a love that will bear the test of trial. Your marriage might be on ice, but the warmth of God's love can melt your hearts. What a quote, huh? Mount of Blessing, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, MB. It's about 62 to page 65. The, this is worth a million dollars. I had a church one time here in America, a lot of family problems. And I, I couldn't handle them all. I sent some to a Christian counselor. I, I met and visited with the counselor first. I asked him, how do you deal with marriages? What do you do with depression, suicide, abuse? And I liked his answers. And he had a method of not just trying psychology. He, he drew people back into the word of God. He had modules where people read scripture as couples. So 
I sent some couples there and uh, I discovered the, the power of the gospel. Now, I got to tell you about uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. I'll put it up and then I will talk to you face to face. Here it is. I'm going to highlight it with blue. So you can see that. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. I am so curious. Time is running, but uh, I want to see what it says in the book of Revelation in Swahili. Ufunua wa Johanna. Is that it? I think so. Lakini. Oh, it's hard when God says Lakini, but, right? Lakini nene nenu yu yako. Ya kwamba, don't know how to pronounce it, upendo wako wakwanza. That must be the verse. Yep, Lakini. But I have this to say against you. You have left your first love. Um. Let me stop the screen sharing. Let's talk face to face, real life. Okay. Not theorizing, not just Bible verses and Pastor Ingo and Greek and Hebrew. I was pastor of a church, super nice church, loved the people, still in touch with some of them, in contact with them, still doing some of their weddings and funerals 20 years later. I made huge mistakes in that church because I was inexperienced and I didn't have a mentor. And the church suffered for it and they loved me anyway. Thank you, church. You know who you are. And my wife and I were planning a picnic for couples or for the whole church. I don't remember. But it was April, just like right now, April. And it would have been well, I can't tell you because then you figure out where it. Confidentiality. I invited some couples to my home, opened my home to discuss the calendar, the picnic, what we can do to draw families out as a church apart from just Sabbath. And then church is over and we go home. We're, we're not like some other countries where it's church all day. Uh, most in the Western world, as far as I know, Germany, America, Hispanic culture is different. I don't want to stereotype, but my experience is we have Sabbath school, church, closing him, socialized, maybe potluck, and then we go home with two hours of church a week. So we want to have more church. And we're discussing the picnic. And now picture the situation. Again, this is not off the internet or a book. This is out of my life. I have a couple sitting across from each other. And the woman says, we will not be at the picnic. And the husband is um, consternated, surprised, and says, why not? Uh, we, we don't have anything planned. And the woman says, well, we're getting a divorce. Announced in public in my home with other couples around. In America, we would say awkward. It is um, 8 p.m., five more minutes or so. I want to introduce the tomorrow, but also finish the story. I won't make it long. It, it was a moment of silence. The husband was shocked. Damahani. I, I didn't know what to say. I'm a young pastor. Uh, <laughs> I said, let's finish the meeting and then talk. Um, is April such and such date okay in this park and you bring sandwiches and you bring the water bottles and we have an activity and we, we finished planning the picnic. We prayed. I sent everybody home. The couple tried to sneak out. Can you imagine you're a man and your wife announces that she filed for divorce in front of other couples. You didn't know about it. 
and she says you should get the paperwork on Monday. <laughs> Unbelievable situation. Uh, it's dark outside now, and everybody's leaving, embarrassed. Um, but I still have the couple in my driveway in front of my house. I said, what is going on? What, what's happening? The man said, I, I have no idea. He was floored, we would say in English. Jaw dropping. The wife said, no, I don't have a boyfriend. We have financial troubles. But then she said something very important. Listen to this. I never forget this. She said, quote, the fizz is gone. Do you know what she means, married couples? The fizz is gone. I, I don't think she was just talking physical relationship, but, but the closeness and excitement of being married was over. You know, when you first date and the feeling and you get married and now you can be married and she says, just dead, the fizz is gone. I, I thought that is an interesting phrase because Revelation chapter two, verse four, Jesus says, Lakini, but I have this against you. You have left your first love. And, and that verse, God, thank God, he must have inspired me that moment. The verse says, you left your first love. The woman said, the fizz is gone. Do you notice the difference? The woman said that our, this first love experience and sincerity and excitement left. Jesus said, no, you left. First Corinthians 13, we will look at that on Friday. Love never fails. God is love. He brought Adam and Eve together. That love does not fail. Our marriages fail. We get divorces, etc. But love does not fail. How does that work for your marriage? Check this out. If you left your first love, that means you can walk back to it. If the love left, then you need to find it somewhere else, right? It, it just left like a soda pop bottle. Shh, gone. But Jesus, that's not how it works. The one that has left is you, which means good news. You can walk back to it. That couple did. There are three levels of relationship, casual, personal, and intimate. And there's touch, eye contact, and talk. Okay? Touching a person. Every culture is different on that. Talking and eye contact. So you start practicing appropriate touch, talk, eye contact on the casual level, then on the personal level, and then, then, last phase, on the intimate level, our culture in the Western world puts level three up front, including touch, and the other is secondary. No, it's the other way around. Talking, listening, eye contact, and touch, personal level, then intimate level. That couple today, I cannot claim credit for that, but they're still married today. They did not get a divorce. It is possible through the gospel of Jesus Christ and his grace to melt hearts of ice and come back together. You have left your first love, which means you can come back to it. I've, I've dealt with couples. I don't really love my wife. Uh, you don't know my husband. Uh, we've tried counseling. Uh, I will talk about counseling tomorrow, the, the dangers of counseling. Even though it has helped some couples, some people, I, I will talk about it. Okay, Don't misunderstand. But it is, it is Jesus. His grace, death, resurrection, theology, Bible that, that can infuse your relationship and you can experience a resurrection. 
Tomorrow we will look at very uh, practical aspects. I will ask the following questions. Let me give you an outlook for tomorrow. That is my paper number two. Um, by the way, all free of charge available at ingosorky.com and click on the button called life. I mean, this is about life, life and death. Let me screen share uh, just a couple minutes here. I'm becoming a Zoom expert. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. For two to be one, keeping your vows while keeping your vows, we will start with the following tomorrow. On a scale from one to 10, how close are you to each other? Being totally honest. And the question with that is, would your partner agree with the number you pick? And I've dealt with couples who on a scale from one to 10 were so far apart, they would say, they would say minus four. And they're still married today. I've had couples that are divorced today. I have couples that I thought you shouldn't get married. Um, difficult. Here are some questions for you to ponder the, the homework for you as couples. And you want to pray before that. Um, you don't want to explode. You don't want to get angry. You don't want to walk out. But here are some questions for you. How did you meet? What attracted you to each other? Was it an arranged marriage? Did you choose? Did you want to get married? Did the wife get pregnant and you had to get married quickly so it wouldn't show and be embarrassing? Talk to each other. Think this through. Describe your relationship to God, self, father, mother, siblings, okay? family dynamics. Does your partner draw you closer to God or farther away? How and why? The best and worst part about our relationship is, is what? My partner doesn't know that. Um, I should wait till tomorrow. But uh, I put this question in there because I was at a wedding and the wife, the, the bride did not know. No, it's the other way around. The husband, the groom did not know that she had been married two times before. He was number three. On the wedding day, he did not know that. So I'm, try I'm trying to intercept uh, situations like that. Okay, can you imagine you're walking down the aisle as a husband and position yourself, then the bride comes, wedding ceremony, and at some point you discover she had been married before two times. What one question would you like to ask your partner? Um, I had a couple... The man, I believe it was, was HIV positive, and they were planning a wedding. So how do you deal with that? What helps unity in your relationship? What hinders it? And how do you talk to your spouse? Describe the tone in your voice when you speak to your husband, when you speak to your wife. I'm closing with the following quote. You see it right here. Closing quote for today. Yeah, we need a fresh start tomorrow with the top 10. Tomorrow is Thursday already. We'll, we'll make it through for two to be one. I still have a lot more planned, but for two days, it'll be good. Here's my closing quote. Steps to Christ, page 43. The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. Steps to Christ, page 43, which means your solution to your marriage is not to get a divorce and get a new spouse. The solution to your marriage is you, not somebody else, you becoming a new person. A second Corinthians, what Corinthian, uh, a, a new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. You become converted. You get a new heart. You become closer to God. 
you get down on your knees in prayer and start fasting. We will talk about that tomorrow. Prayer and fasting for your marriage. Your conversion. You receiving the grace and love of God and forgiveness. That is our starting point for two to be one. Don't wait for the right person. You become the right person. Thank you for joining me today. I still hear people saying, Pastor, you don't know my wife. You don't know my relationship. You don't know my husband. There are unbelievers uh, married to believers. There's drinking. There's abuse. There's adultery. We are, we are tackling this not by ourselves, not with psychology that I'm not an expert in, but, but with the powers of heaven. I would like to pray with you and I would like to pray for you. And every day this week, I'm making a special commitment to get out of bed before time, just like Jesus while it was still dark and uh, pray specifically for you. I don't know you. You don't know me. <laughs> Who is Ingo? I've been a pastor for 30 years, college professor. Um, the last thing I professionally did was a uh, hospice chaplain dealing with dying people very rewarding and since december 11 501 p.m 2020 i'm a, just a self-supporting minister and pastor weddings funerals still and preaching all over the place but most importantly husband of over 30 years father of two grown sons and living my life most importantly, on my knees in repentance and seeking God. That's who I am. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. We will look at practical aspects. I do this with couples before they get married and uh, share some thoughts with you practically what can be done in your situation, possibly. But let us pray together again, and then I will see you Tomorrow, and I will say, Kua Heri. Yeah. Oh, Father, we, we are talking about your word. We are pondering men and women. We are wrestling with life and death, with sin and salvation. Oh, God, how broken we are and filthy defiled, corrupt, fallen. We, we ask for your salvation. We're asking for Yeshua, for Jesus. We're asking that you might not be displeased with us. We humbly ask that we don't find the right person, but that we become the right person to be found. We pray for forgiveness. We have said things. We have uh, had a tone in our voice that was inappropriate for a Christian man and Christian woman as well. We want to become Ephesians 5 couples where the man is just like Jesus. Whatever that entails in your life, men, whatever that means, what needs to change, what I pray as men we can come closer to Jesus. Show us where we need to change, where we need to die to self, where we need to become new creations for the, the woman in our life we ask for your mercy for your grace we pray that the change we are promising is not an empty promise but that it's a lasting fundamental foundational change to the core and that the women around us 
can see that we are a different person now. Something has changed. We ask for that. We want to cooperate with you, God. I pray for the women, the ladies, that they become daughters of God, princesses and queens. I pray for healing if they have experienced abuse, broken hearts, tears at night, loneliness, separation, misunderstanding. Oh, save our marriages, our relationships. God is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Oh, thank you for joining us again today. We only have two days left. Okay. I hope you can make it tomorrow and on Friday. Lots more to discuss, explore, think, pray, and talk about. But it's a privilege to spend this time with you every day this week. It's been a great uh, privilege yeah, from us. Uh... Uh, for us to